Hello, everyone. This is the favorite meeting of the year. And I'm glad we're not having it in January. Yes. This is better. Um, so we have a list of topics and you all have the agenda. Uh, should we do a roll call since we are being filmed? Yeah, let's do it. I'll start it and we'll go right around. So, Mayor Jill Pitt. Sorry, <laughs> it's not going to be Mayor Pro Tem, Susie Bella Karen. Uh, City Councilman, Mario Sean Coy. Karen Rodriguez, City Council. Shakita Yapa, City Council. Dave Warren Proctor, Assistant City Manager, Floods and Public Square. Public Mayor Shaw, Sir Hill Wise. Kevin Doyle, Strategic Immigration. Jeff Satter, Police Chief. Jamie Roth, Deputy City Attorney. Tony Marsh, City Manager's Office. Harold Ruby, City Manager. Senator Sonia Hawkins Lewis, uh, Senate District 17, which is wonderful Long Lawn, Erie, and Lafayette. And Karen McCormick, State Representative. I think we need to go around getting said by Fox so fast. We have a lot of say, my district is Long Lawn. So we have Diane Chris, they come a little later, she's a councilwoman. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marcia Martin is also councilwoman. She is uh, out of state at the moment, so she obviously won't be here. So the first thing on our agenda, there is that, it's on the, uh, mm -hmm. is top concerns for public safety. So Jeff, until Zach comes back, <laughs> What do you want us to say? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Saved by the Zach. And I would more than that. I think we have a lot to say. I think we've all talked about these over there. Yeah, so more than that.
distributed to the use of the vacuum and said that the hospital being blocked by the nurse was some type of medical staff isolated from the family fears and counseling. So one of the things that we'll tell you that the doctor that has done for us, uh, we did have a meeting the last couple of weeks ago. Uh, we did a pilot program um, for the school. Uh, the the score. We, yeah, they, they call it score now. Um, but Andy used to go down in the hall um, is over our origin. And so we decided um, to put in permission inside the school to work with um, the school system and try to address mental health issues that are working there. Uh, we did 45 days we did it in school. Um, within those 45 days, it's about two months to get a given day because we're just talking about school and we need to drive. Um, we had 125 touch points, uh, meaning that we not necessarily dealt with different kids, but we were in contact different places, different locations, um, 25, 125 times. So, One school? No, so this is across just the school of Lama. So if you know what you're saying, the rain is actually stretching at Lama, but this is just Lama at school. Um, we were in this year, 18 different schools. That we responded to with this team is basically an SRO mission. Um, and then they tried to do what they call a minimum of two follow up contacts. Meaning they're trying to get resources outside of the school for the school leaders to be able to take care of. It's something that uh, we can talk to, to Don about and how we can help them to uh, think it's a budget issue for them and so fund this position. So uh, we actually got the idea from Cups of Out. They actually went from there. There's not a lot in the state right now. Uh, but we did all the power program and we did, we did see um, a need for that. So we'll continue to do that. But again, once if we can't get them in the school, we can't get them the resources that they're home and they're really moving from their home, that really seems to be a challenge both for uh, the community to try to get them in place. Um, do you want to talk about how many times we're in the elementary schools? Get yeah, ready. Sure. I, I don't have an exact number, but I see what you're talking about. This was not just our middle schools and our high schools. So we were also in the elementary schools, which, yeah, so I can start I, early, I guess, is the point. Yeah, so we can, we can catch up. We get all the people that include middle, high school, uh, elementary schools uh, that are within the St. Marie School System in the city. Um, I don't have a broken down specifically for this school board. We did have contact with, I think, it's at 18 different schools that didn't have an SRO over because uh, if you know where the elder schools are, the elder schools don't have SRO over the coach club, not the club. And that's typically the staff issue, not just the academic part of the same thing. The other issue that I can list in there. Um, can, the, can I ask you about that? Yeah, yeah please. Are we allowed to ask questions? Oh, okay. 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 You have to stop them first. <laughs> <laughs> No, they're just all going. Um, and do they, uh, is it all on school? Were they able to, I don't know, extrapolate the success on those kids, perhaps be able to stay more stable and stay home and might not end up being out of their house in the hospital? So, so I don't have the answer to that. I happen to sit with uh, the title this is a, this is a we can keep the child in school and we don't have to go with them on the street. We can get them the treatment they need to do this, but we don't, then that helps curb their behavior and the So trying to start that pretty early on. Um, and so I don't have any data and I don't know that I'm going to share that with you per se. Uh, but I don't have any of that data as far as how many things that affect it. Um, I can try to talk to uh, our psychologist that we have and oversee them further and see if she can get any data out of us. Well, it's just a great idea. It's a great idea because you can move it further up the chain of where the process starts. Uh, you know, certainly we need more um, treatment beds, but if we can get to those kids right. um, before they even move to each other, which is what. Correct, and that is, that's the goal, is try to keep them in their home and in school. In school. Uh, yeah. But we do know that there's a little bit of time that there's a children who have to be there simply because it's education. Uh, and so the parents are going to have resources. Yeah. And so that, I think that's the key to why our condition is kind of on point. 
Can you try to get some stuff in the program? We can also make sure that
That would just be that question, uh, that, that request. Hey, just a couple of... So attorneys know that information, and oh, they, yes, they have the sober apparel. Yes. They know we can't negotiate, we know we're not going to jump without a dog search for... Yeah, they figured it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, loophole, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Robin Horvick is making an excellent point about when she asked about the French Attorney General Weiser, because he leads legislation that he believes um, that has been identified with not only law enforcement, but other areas, and to to modify current state law. I just worked with him this session and last session on some modification of laws that were brought to his office. If he along with those things, Some of these things, but HIV, some of these things, we don't have 
to get the car and buy a house and stuff like that. So, again, try to hold some of these folks accountable to do it, but you're going to be taking the issues you're going to be doing by selling products. If you really want to, what you would look for and ask. You know, just to piggyback off of that, just one of the things that I have this guy to tell you, one of the challenges here that I've seen in the last few years is the juvenile defense. You know, you're going to be down to the felon, you're going to be senior. Not suggesting that these go back to the felonies or you're a bunch of kids with felon charges. But we do have an issue here. And I would tell you that we found a video that one of our home sites on the youth. In our community, that were standing with firearms, pointing them and sitting that day, and the council have seen that. Uh, it was on YouTube, and it was available for everyone to see. We actually reached out to their parents through Family and Children's Services and said, hey, we want to meet with you. Not police, but we want to meet with you at the city law and see how we can help you. We had as far as I know, zero parents um, want to meet with us to see what resources there were, and really didn't seem to have any heartaches of the child. And so this is, we're starting to see kids more and more get shot and killed. Um, and this seems to be an issue that I know is a challenge for law, it's a challenge for us all the time. There really needs to be some kind of accountability for the use of firearms. Uh, again, we're starting to hold adults, and we're going to get caught with firearms. We need to start holding our youth because they're actually using them. And that's what we're starting to see. So no more showing up at the very beginning of Friday night to fight, because now I've got to come and shoot you. Now, I'm not intend to shoot you, but I'm going to shoot your car, I'm going to shoot at your house, and we're starting to see that become a significant issue across the country for us. Mayor, um, I will just close on these three things real quick. Thank you for uh, yeah. the legislature for allowing that the, uh, the bill for murder suspects to not be bail or going to the voters in November. Uh, you know, the judges are telling the criminal court, the judges have been very good to set high bail for bonds on those individuals who can stay in jail. Uh, but based on the Supreme Court ruling, Last year, or think last year, or this year. Uh, appreciate you taking that after the members to make that. I also appreciate um, the work that we did collectively to deal with persons detained in jail on the emergency commitments for a while. And in addition to that bill, just having them go directly to a treatment facility, which may or may not be available. Uh, but it really affected some of the uh, agencies in southern Colorado and eastern Colorado, where those hospitals are maybe an hour or two away. Um, it still may not be the top of the facility. So being able to hold them within a reasonable amount of out of jail, get things calmed down quickly, and get them transferred to appropriate facility. Thank you for that. And then last but not least, thank you very much uh, for the dispatcher being classified as first responder. That is huge for them. Um, and then Representative Coleman, thank you very much. I'm going to make them set aside uh, for this later chatting uh, out HB 24, 14, 16, and a lot of work with this comment bill that really is to protect whistleblowers. There were some challenges with that bill, uh, but I appreciate that what we were able to do uh, is bring this a whole back to the table issue, which I know this conversation is going to have it, and really craft a bill that really needs to be intent to do that. So thank you very much for, for listening and working with us to have that address. It's important to slow things down sometimes. So, yes, yeah, sir. Really important. Uh, just, just a quick feedback yes, on the uh, distribution of drugs and how it goes together with guns. Mm -hmm. Um, the latest Supreme Court case for he actually now has called into question um, because the Supreme Court ruled that if you had a conviction for domestic violence, you do not uh, have a gun in the states that pass that. The problem is it's also raised the issue about drug charges and having guns, and the Supreme Court has already said they are going to bring it up in for 2025. So the reason why I'm telling you that is because um, I run the Red Violence Prevention Bill every year, and we were looking at this exact one, but what happens is when we get to the Capitol, people are like, why should you do that now when the Supreme Court is going to have the ruling this next term? So just know that that may put a little bit of a damper on the decision, waiting to see what the Supreme Court will do. And then the discussion that we will go on in the Supreme Court well, you can kind of see which direction and like uh, that was happening this fall. So we did, yeah, in New York, right there, there's a lot of change in the Supreme Court level. Uh, but I think the idea is just to keep this at the forefront. Right. Because we yes. do see it. Uh, I agree. <laughs> we do see it. 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 We do see it.
are shooting with our homicides. And uh, again, it's just simply making sure that that's at least on the table for our conversation this year. And then we're limited by what the Supreme Court does. Great conversation and interaction as far as what's happening. And, you know, so thank you very much. The next thing on our agenda is a discussion of the grants that the city has received from the state. Um, like every jurisdiction, we working on housing, transportation, education, um, and land use, but we don't have the dollars. We need help from the state. So you have, I think, in front of you a list of the grants. And um, I don't know how we want to do this. Um, I thought I would just point out a couple that what we're going to talk about this afternoon is about particularly council priorities around housing, transportation, and housing development, early care and education. If you look, probably half of these grants are public safety grants. So yes, those, <laughs> yeah. most definitely. Yeah. But there are also ones around water efficiency and cost testing. There are ones for early care and education as well as transportation. Um, and so we really appreciate all of the different grant supports and wanted to give you a list of how we can benefit from those grant programs. Um, do you, Harold, do you want to speak to any of these uh, in specific in the areas that you're working with, like LHA or uh, housing in general, transportation for our market transit? Uh, yeah, so I think, well, there's a few, there's a few pieces. So not last year, but the year before, we received some of the, the first um, funds coming out of the problem from the break. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, um, I said that was $1.7 million uh, that we used to purchase uh, the property uh, adjacent to Costco, we already purchased an affordable housing property. And, and so we're at the point now where uh, we're going through the entitlement process. So we're going to build 185 for sale homes, uh, of which 55 of those will be permanently be restricted affordable capital A. Um, so that's going to be below um, 8% AMI. And then the remaining uh, homes will be attainable homes, and those won't have a rolling deed restriction that also looks at that generation of time. And those will all be under 120% AMI qualifies. Um, we are actively looking for um, additional state support on that project uh, because in order to get it done, Waivers, obviously, we bought the land. Uh, we look at the pro forma, there's still a gap in that project. And so, to keep it moving, we work, we're talking to the council where um, we're going to have to put in an additional six million of our affordable housing funds in order to pay annual housing funds over the next three years to get that project done. Uh, we're still applying for grants on this because um, if we can get grants and not utilize funds in our affordable annual housing fund we move into another project. So we're trying to balance that. So what's not in this is the Department of Housing has really worked with us over the last few years. Uh, so Longmont was um, unique in that um, we've had three consecutive years in a row where we've had a selection of DOH and LIDAC. So um, we just had a grand opening in Christmas too. Um, we are, we are finishing up uh, Sydney, which is 55 permanent supported housing units, and we're starting the lease up process now. Uh, and then at the end of this month, we're hopefully closing on the scent, which is 88-ish, I the number exactly, um, family, affordable family housing. So that's going to be one, two, three, and four bedrooms with the early child care center as part of the process. Uh, so we have, so the states really helped us there. It's not on this list because it's a different funding switch. Uh, but I think as you just generally look at housing and where we're moving, uh, you know, really looking at utilizing our one to 23 funds. And uh, we're noodling around on some other projects, uh, trying to figure out how it works. Uh, we have one project that's in the middle of the housing authority, which is an interesting program, to say the least. It, um, you know, it applies a tax exemption from the state, but it sort of moves around how you handle affordable housing. 
and the, and the special limited partnerships where the local jurisdictions can negotiate uh, a fee in order to get the tax exemption to offset the impacts of policy property tax. And so it sort of bypasses that. Uh, the project we were working on, we were able to negotiate it, but it um, uh, creates a consternation in the middle of the housing program because they didn't think about it that way. But they also need local municipality support for it to move forward. So the developer was willing to do it. Um, it's interesting as to whether or not the local housing authority is willing to honor what the developer goes forward. So we're looking at some other options, but um, I get what they're trying to do, but by applying that proper exemption without taking it through the local jurisdiction, it creates local challenges. So we've got a lot of housing work going on, and we have more projects. Um, I think I want to talk about this right now. <laughs> in terms of everything that we have in terms of housing. So, you know, we're going to add, I think Molly and I get the numbers, 500-ish, including Crispin units in the next three or four years, four to five hundred units. Um, and, and a big part of this sale, which is you know, 185 for sale units. Uh, if all the tangible blows, you can barely really see that in the state. Uh, so, kind of grants and housing together. What is the name of those the property uh, that's next to Mustang? So, right now it's called how it was called Project Mustang. Uh, and that's because that was the code name for Costco when it came in. Okay. They now changed it to House Pad because they haven't been able to think of a good name. Okay. So it's going to have a different name. Um, the the question around House Pad is um, Longmont did such a nice job with fields on 15, um, and that was a big partnership of a variety of people, corporate, Angola, Chapa, all of these different. Are, are those opportunities still available now? Or is that something that... They're still available. Okay. And so everything that we're building, uh, so unlike other housing authorities, and, and frankly, I don't know how much you know, long, uh, the city of Longmont is uh, absorbing the Longmont Housing Authority. So, um, but we're still separate. The structure of the council is against the housing authority. They, they still perform. What happens when you self perform is it actually reduces your capacity to have the units that you need. So, every project that I talk about is in partnership with the private developer, state agencies, our affordable housing funds. And so, there are a lot of people out there looking to do this. Um, and, and it's interesting today, we, we have requests coming in on a regular basis now that we've seen what we've been able to do. Uh, I think what the council's really also said to us is be judicious and making sure you're getting the needs that were created under our housing needs and health. So um, it's really kind of data and full process that we're going through. I guess part of my curiosity is because they were actually corporate partners, you know, you had um, what's the parent companies? Aetna, Aetna, CBS, which I found fascinating mm -hmm. to see. That, and I was wondering if those funds. If you're still like, a corporate partner, so we want to do that. Because yeah, we can certainly, as being state representatives, we can have a mouthpiece to some companies saying, hey, we did this before, and we do it again. You know, so I just didn't know if those kind of things were still happening. There are some, but there are some examples of it. I think it depends on where their employees are located and, and what they're trying to solve. So, you know, one of the interesting pieces that um, I came across last week is, and this is related to a project that's looking at, so you can utilize revenue bonds and or CFPs to build a facility and you use the, the building itself or the housing as equity. The problem is you still have to have to hit the 1.2 to 1.3 debt ratio, which for our perspective uh, is, is a challenge. And, Try to figure it out. Uh, what I ran across is <coughs> you can go to these corporate partners and they actually secure the debt by giving you capacity to their uh, funds that are out, so fund balance or their equity positions. Uh, and so we're trying to understand what that means from the tax liability perspective. And then if it falls into an enterprise zone or an opportunity 
zone, there may be even more tax benefits, but it's a way to allow us to leverage and you know, not necessarily have it all close. Okay. So we're, we're trying to figure out. Things. But can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. So we did, we were able to pass um, House Bill 1175, that, that actually was one of the bills that were responsive. It was vetoed last year. We made some adjustments to it. Um, basically, what the bill does is it gives a right of first refusal to a local government if there is a multi unit building that meets certain qualifications, that the local government could actually be basically the first chance of purchasing it to convert it to affordable housing. Uh, is this going to be helpful? We were hoping this would be very helpful to you as you look forward in the projects. Um, have you talked about the developments? Is, is there something? That you looked at with it, you just got it signed, and it was signed at the very last moment. So, I think it goes back to what I was talking about with this project. Is you actually have the funds, you have the funds to be able to purchase it and be able to issue that and move through that process. And so, I think at least from the long term housing board's perspective and our HCR housing community investment, being able to do that in terms of money that we have passed. Sub market 
concrete for the land because they're balancing that as a donation to the city. So then it's until they then make it to the tax application. And then I think a lot of times we lose that because people don't think to come to us and come it. So I do think it helps us at least be on the forefront of the conversation. Yeah, because now they have, because our funds are high, at least with those problems, they need to let me know first. So a question for RD under 75, um, and it probably was working the tax credits because, of course, housing is going to be sold at market value, but that doesn't work for us. And if we can't afford to pay market value, then what's the point? But is there any kind of incentive to, if they go uh, below a certain percentage of market value, then tax credits are offered to the owner? I mean, that's exactly, that's, what, what, that's exactly what Harold was saying. Mm -hmm. This bill will now require for these buildings to call into this criteria. Mm -hmm. Those owners have to let them in first. Okay. And so mm -hmm. that's where you can have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. And so then we could go out and look at the for it. And also we partner with NGL uh, and Rose. Could allow us to go look for a development.
you buy a house, one of the first things they tell us is don't go buy a car, don't make any big purchases. Once you're qualified, here's the do's and the don'ts. And, and then what we saw in other areas of the nation when they try to do is that was a significant head because so many people were dropping out because they were doing that. And having a team that was really locked at the head with each other and working with the individuals to ensure that from the point you go into contract and qualification, when you get to closing, they're ready to go because part of the reform is to get it to work. You have to be um, we have to really narrow the carrying costs on this project. And so, you know, we have about nine weeks carrying costs for each home. So they have to be able to go. And uh, so that's what we're working on. Great. So the other thing under these grant discussions was transportation and economic development in, in the past year. But um, the economic development, I think you've kind of covered that, but Costco was our biggest economic development project. I think. Would you agree with that? Yeah, last year, you know, we had a pretty good run. Yeah. Uh, for one year, we had AGC Biologics, and we had some other, um, we had two smaller groups. But in terms of local revenue, Costco was significant in many ways because we're now starting to see that spin. We knew what's going to occur with them, and so in terms of other groups that are wanting to come in just because they located. Um, Costco is, is one of probably a handful of companies, retail, that can redefine a trade area. And, and so we're definitely seeing that. And with transportation, you probably are very aware of the rate that has to do with this transport, that we are hopefully working very hard with it. RTD, it's a, it's a challenge, <laughs> for sure. yes, for sure. But I think that um, with our density and with FRP our coming, we're actually going to be working with the government, but we don't see it. Getting it all together. So um, plans for next year around the healthy transportation and land use. Mary, this is actually Gerald's question. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. And this is really for our legislators around, you know, uh, we've all obviously seen some tweets and big bills over the last couple of years yes. around the yeah. house and the application. And we're seeing more in the next session. Well, I know um, Gerald and I have Basically, giving incentives for ADUs and unincorporated. Now, that doesn't affect you as much, but there are a lot of unincorporated areas in the right outside of Walmart of folks that really want to improve uh, or have the ability to do ADUs and unincorporated. Uh, the governor has indicated that he would be willing to define that. So, it's supposed to be included in Bill 213, the controversial bill from the previous session. Um, but that really went through uh, a lot of negotiations so they couldn't be more ADU. But at this time, I know that's going to come up again. That's the only housing related one that I know, other than just more working with municipalities for grants, loan programs. Certainly, the head of the head of public uh, housing uh, related to Cambria is really making changes and really doing a lot there. So I think she really wants, as a former city council person, she wants to work more with municipalities. So I'm hopeful that she'll bring a lot more to the table. I'm curious about this um, 1.5 century greenway grant starting to spend now. What, what is that? So you got the same thing. Is that a budget? Is this a budget grant that is going to connect here in the green? No, no it's going to connect out um, east here up to Barbara Pond, so it's okay. a connection where you see that, and you've got 1.5 million of you know, a much larger project okay. um, as a uh, component of a, a grant. So we're working currently, the design is 100% completed, and we're just working to 
um, we're working with the property owner on the last slide of that project. This is actually a tour. Oh, is it? Yes. Yeah. And this is more than a half. Perhaps it's some negotiating issues. It'll be a nice connection so. again. Okay. Green light connection. Yeah, that's yes. what it's yeah, no, it's on the agenda. It's core house conversations. They wanted us to buy the entire property. So that's on the agenda. I think generally, if I could jump in on the transportation piece, yep. so you know, we we look at we had a lot of conversations about being more intentional and um, looking at housing, transportation, uh, going for staff that's really strong in terms of our land use code. So a lot of things people were fussing about in mean, this legislation with land use code. You know, we're sitting back here going, man, hey, it's already in our code. Mm -hmm. uh, we're tied. I mean, the challenge is the public. <coughs> and uh, but all of that's in our land development code in terms of how we move forward. Um, I do appreciate the piece on the ADU and the HOAs because um, we were definitely seeing that there are segments of our of our community that was being. Um, more than others because they were in places that could have been because they didn't necessarily have any place. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens over time. Yeah. And it'll be good. But uh, so we look at it as a system. So when, when you think about the projects that I talked about, all of them are adjacent to a transportation system. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I um, think both of you are trained. Well, that's not yeah, I was in committee. Right. So you were on the train. So when we look at the development around uh, uh, First of May in terms of training, transit oriented development, um, you can build, I call Phil the Rainmaker because he can bring grants in and buy you like crazy. Uh, but, um, you know, the work we're doing on the public private partnership on the transit station, that's moving as we speak. So, um, Joe and her team have been acquiring land moving forward um, and really getting housing associated with the transit station. Um, the other project I mentioned we're moving around is, is in the TOD area as well. But all the others are near the transit route. And uh, we also partnered with RTD and on um, their grant process for, I can't remember what it's called. This is the partnership. Partnership grant on creative ways to approach transit. And so Joni and her team have also been involved in selecting a micro transit partner. Um, Congressman Goose could give us a million dollars for that. I think they're near the end of that selection process. We are near it, I can't speak about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think our hope is that. Uh, September ish. Yeah, we're like optimistic about so, like we're in. So, so, so we'll have this micro transit center. So, really, now, I mean, our bus service is great. It doesn't matter if we serve everyone in the community. This is really that last mile attaching to it, getting folks across. Uh, and so, all of that is built in in terms of how we look at housing and a broader community system. Yeah. The good thing is, is that they did intentionally bid the project where other municipalities um, can piggyback on that bid if they choose to. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed, we're hoping that other uh, municipalities that are adjacent to us start coming in and participating in that because then it gets all the broader transportation um, challenge. And when you think about it, uh, the mayor and I have had a lot of conversations about our park range passing the rail. It really starts filling the void that exists where there may not be a station on the front end that you can still get to the station without having to drive a parking park in the road. So hopefully in a couple of months, you know, we'll be announcing that. But you won't know. Could I ask a question about the airport? You got two different areas about airport grants on there. I don't, this is not related to your grant and what's happening at the airport, but in the last two weeks, so one for me, which is unusual for me to get this, but I've had 
two constituents from Long Long and Joe about like, touching goes. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure this is something that you're all hearing about. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where we're going to be that decision. So what's the plan? Who let Yeah. I mean, I basically told the, it's not it's not about the letter or this kind of letter, but it's um, uh, basically the touch and go where they're training and they're touching on and they're walking in. That is a new uh, allowance that the airport manager apparently has just started to do. At least that's what both the residents read. Yeah, it's a great really good information. Okay. okay. We always allow to touch those. Okay. Um, and we have had our training mm -hmm. companies out there training, you know, um, teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So FAA is pretty clear touching those for training. That's a long-standing practice. You know, I think probably what constituents in Mama in particular are seeing is, you know, maybe a higher percentage of folks mm -hmm. who are training on Rocky Mountain mm -hmm. who are actually coming to Mama. Same is true um, from you know people calling from you know Berthoud and, and Loveland Fort Collins. So you know you can't control where people are practicing and flying, um, but certainly yes, we, we get our fair share of the phone calls. Um, mm -hmm. At the airport, the folks who are, you know, have some consternation about that, but we don't really have any ability to manage them. The, the way it was problem. presented to my office is that this was a relatively new decision from the Mont manager at, at Mont Mont. They did, something has changed apparently in the, in the eyes of these constituents that the know has increased or something. Is this the increase the volume? Maybe that's. Well, I, I think after the situation at Jeffco Airport, uh, and the group that was really from Roosevelt Lafayette, it's a very, yes. very rare area that was really in Roosevelt that were against, uh, you know, really came out strong about the lead fuels. Right. Then all of a sudden, it's kind of, we're finally getting the residual, I think, effect of people that are. And I think we did have a problem for a while of people. A group that was really out there, you know, uh, watchdogging yes. the, the noise level for a long time. It kind of fell off, and now we've got kind of a new group that's uh, cognitive of it. Maybe it's because of lead fuels as well, and other things like that. In my opinion, I think what, what would be really beneficial out there is somehow we can attract uh, some of these electric plane uh, manufacturers to use this as, the, as their test. Uh, site for having more of those types of planes for just you know personal use at that airport, and then you probably see the reduction because of the noise level uh, uh, from uh, electric opposed to gas powered uh, planes. So, somehow we could somehow figure out a way of attracting a business like that to here, then I think that might be interesting. We're here in Rumble. I guess about older, having uh, kind of getting uh, uh, people talking about them getting rid of that airport. Yeah, that's a Yeah. So that, that might bring in more people to the long run. I will. So are you, um, along these lines, are you, is this becoming more and more that people are interested in having you get involved more with either noise or lead? Well, I think it is a misunderstanding on the public's part that we do not control the airport because we own it. Right. They think that we have full jurisdiction over it. Right. But once uh, we only have the wheels are on the ground, right. as soon as they're off, it's FAA. Right. Um, but to the point that uh, Sean was making, we had a presentation from our manager, airport manager, and he is looking at all the technology for the different fuels, but he did make an interesting point, which I was unaware of, is that not every unleaded fuel will work with every plane, even if on their engines, and who's making it, and what the fuel con lead content is, or... That's what that bill you know, did pass, and yes, that Representative Brown was running, was to be more of an incentive-based program for some of the funding for airports that was start to encourage movement of those planes that can move towards unsighted type fields. Um, so I'm not sure the mechanics of how uh, once that bill is set up, um, but it, it truly is, is that to open a door to incentivize airports and um, pilots and their airplanes to, to move that direction. 
connection. So rather than, um, and I know he worked really hard on moving as far as he could with that mm -hmm. bill, um, and that's why you're going to be speaking with that constituent later. <laughs> <laughs> well, one last thing, as my understanding, the jump plane has like several different patterns that it has to go through. Uh, so it doesn't go in the same pattern even every time it takes off for jumping so that oh, it doesn't yeah. go over people's yeah. and my friend, um, We have suggested to um, take off the landing grounds uh, with their suggested. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and I it depends think, on the weather. Yeah, so yeah, there's, sure yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. there's other pieces. I think to your question, have we been involved in it? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
you'll see there are pictures of the end. Mm -hmm. um, so the city stepped in actually and go out over here to yeah. get in and then take those insurance money from the tech program to, to help with the city. But there were also some state legislative rules that they said were prohibitive yes. in, in having students be kind of on the floor for manufacturing and in some other areas. And so yeah. they found several businesses that were pulling out of the internship program at the last year. So part of it was cybersecurity, but I feel like it was the yes, and yes, and yes that that prohibited. That's, that's right. So yeah. bring broke about this. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So he, like, within the last few months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to connect in with, um, I'll have to go back and look at my email. And he did write about this. And I, 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 I was trying to connect him to the IT. Um, I'm not sure what happened after I made that connection. So it might be, it might be a good follow up. That would yeah. be a good follow up because I think our. We, well, our meeting was at the end of May. Okay. So okay, so maybe did he contact you? No, or I think it was before that. Before that. So yes. Yeah, so let me let me go find it. I think we would just encourage you to continue that conversation. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. I think it was kind of what came out of the conversation okay. uh -huh. was that yeah. we want to take these students who are willing to do those internships and for something that's locked in the private sector. Yeah. And doing it, but, you know, yeah. And I think yeah, from the state level, we're looking at that piece, and then from our end, it's just really. I think providing that training for businesses. I had a chance to uh, talk to Scott Cook from the Chamber, uh -huh. and that was something we were we were kind of um, we were looking at is how can we you know just kind of lay those spheres of yes. businesses and really have them understand what the legislation is as well as um, you know the benefits and, and how it is yeah. to do this. Yeah. And as well as other, other things as far as student engagement in their, in their facility and how to even be a, um, how, to, how to be a mentor to, to a right. student in the business. What would that look like? So I think there's several pieces, but one of the pieces that, um, and that's that true, that yeah. is there, there could be almost a template for um, the business or the mm -hmm. um, entity that's going to host the in intern. Yes. It's like a rubric that you follow, or how do you follow up to make sure that that mm -hmm. student is is getting exposure to mm -hmm. education? Because many of them may have never had. That's right. So they're kind of creating like creating the process. Yeah. But if we have There's something like that they can go to, that's something that's concrete. Yeah. That so at least they can build from. Uh -huh. And that could be something that could be handled through the chamber mm -hmm. or um, yep. Uh, but um, as far as um, issues around legislation, there's if there's some words on that hold me out bad, that we can yeah, so maybe we can yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we there's an apprenticeship or internship that goes on almost every year. Uh -huh. so, okay. Yeah. So on that same subject, excuse me, are there unions that have internships and funds? Yes. They all 
have some sort of career technical student uh, activities, whether it's a, uh, it's also some sort of training in, in career readiness. So that's part of the standard that they all have to meet in the high school level. If we're talking also about you know some of the industrial stuff, it's usually at 16 years old and a junior you, to even get into some of these programs. You can't because of that idea of you know some of the requirements about safety. So, exactly what you are changing, the one thing I want to say that I'm really excited about is that we are having our first ever um, 4th of July event that the city is sponsoring. And uh, our Innovation Center for the Kids in St. Ray Valley School District, the Innovation Center, are going to put on a drone show for us. That's the drone show. Three so, yeah. yeah. so, 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 some of the preliminary has been down on socials. Good. <laughs>
whether they want to. Okay, so I do want to ask about this um, Water Smart grant with the partners of the year that Julie wrote me about. Um, that uh, they had a meeting today, 10 this morning. Do you know anything about this? Um, that, and I, I was so excited to hear that Walmart may be looking at doing this, that instead of um, using typical grade infrastructure for wastewater treatment, especially for temperature yes. um, and water quality to utilize um, wetlands, landscape, you know, it's going to be uh, more efficient and less costly over time. And so there, there was a bill that we just passed that is having CSU and the Mortison Center actually study the feasibility of this across the state. And then I get this, this from Judy Graff because she had a, I guess with, um, there's, a, there's a grant from the Department of the Interior for Water Smart, smart uh, for the City of Walmart's Wastewater Treatment Plan. Yeah, very fair. So I hope, I hope the city gets the grant. And does that mean there must be land you could buy? We're working on that. Another negotiation. I'm like, this is really exciting because I'm um, just learning about this and the, I can't remember the guy, this scientist that was really promoting this and he came and gave us a presentation. It was so exciting. So, okay. Anyway, so yeah, I'm wondering how we can do this morning. Can we go for another round of research? Yeah. So that's our agenda. However, now that we have these uh, representatives here, is there anyone else from staff that would like to dig it? Or anyone mm -hmm. would like to question? Well, we've got them cornered. Yeah. <laughs> so, or a suggestion for what you need. It's a small town, you know where to find Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have any other questions for us? I just want to thank. I want to thank all of you, but especially my thank Sandy, <laughs> because I, I'm constantly writing to Sandy, and she answers me, unfortunately, even on Sundays. So uh, I'm just, just thank you very much for being so responsive. I go, I don't expect you to answer me on Sunday. I just want to put it out there so that I can be um, very helpful during the session on um, keeping us on, you know, up to date with things that you have talked about on Tuesday nights, and um, even uh, I'll ask her about certain bills that we haven't talked to her about, but um, she'll respond and let me know that, hey, you know, we're okay with that, or it's not a concern. So I just, you, you just are a really um, important resource for me. <laughs> I appreciate you asking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank you at your public service, but also mom dozens of times during all of our housing committee meetings that we long on as a champion for all the different types of partnerships in housing, your APU policy, the things that you're doing for affordable housing. You, I can't even tell you the number of times. The testimony that many of you gave um, is so important to what we do. So I just want to let you know that you're, you're leading the state when it comes to issues like that. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time this not good. Thank you for dinner. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so.